Um, a couple of quick housekeeping before we start. We've had to change the order of some panels today because one of our speakers was diverted to Houston, Texas last night. So our next panel will be the nuclear panel and we will have the conversation with Jim Shudo and Toria Newland at 11.15. So um, adjust your expectations accordingly. Um, now I'm thrilled to introduce the next panel talking about national security today, emerging challenges and opportunities. So I think this is a great way to kick off Friday after hearing all of the challenges that we are facing to think about how General Clark from Special Ops Command, uh, Congressman Crow from Colorado and Senator Ernst in conversation with Courtney Kuby, who's part of NBC News, our media partner. So please join me and welcome them to the stage. Thanks, Neve. So um, welcome to day, uh, the final day of what's been a fascinating week filled with so many interesting conversations. And I think we have another one coming up here now, emerging threats and challenges. Um, you know, as I, was, I was, as I was preparing for this, I came to realize that this is a very a huge subject, right? So many possible challenges that exist right now and that the US is facing in the future. So we're gonna try and drill down on a couple of them here. The first one that I think is probably the most immediate right now is drones. UAVs, UASs, whatever you want to call them. Everything from these small quadcopters you can literally buy on Amazon to much more advanced systems. So uh, let's, I want to start there. Senator Ernst, the, the threat has really evolved just in the last decade from, on drones. Uh, the, the, how they present such a challenge, not just on a battlefield or a conflict zone, but to a civilian population at this point. So, how do you see that continuing to change in the future? Well, thank you, Courtney. And, and this is one of those areas that uh, we like to address, try to address through the Emerging Threats and Capabilities Subcommittee of the Armed Services in, in the Senate. I'm the ranking member on that subcommittee. And we do see this as a growing problem because if you look at the availability of inexpensive drones, you find that the violent extremist organizations uh, that we battle uh, around the globe have easy access to this technology. They don't need to develop anything. All they need to do is hop on Amazon and they can buy a $300 drone that can be used against an adversary. And so it is a real concern. But as we look to the future, we know that the Chinese, the Russians, um, and others are putting a lot of money into what we call swarm technology. So it's not just the one-offs that are being purchased on the internet, but now we have near-peer adversaries uh, that are developing swarm technology where they can use 100 to 200 different drones, highly, um, highly evolved drones that can attack our service members on the battlefield, uh, perhaps disrupt uh, a Super Bowl game, whatever it might happen to be. So we do have to focus not only on the drone technology, but then anti-drone technology. And those are the things that we need to develop through AI and so forth. But it is a big concern that we have going forward. And we see this technology again being used all over, whether it's um, you know perhaps Al-Shabaab that can gain that technology in Africa, where there is being used throughout CENTCOM. So it is something that, that we pay attention to, but not only pay attention to, but we're putting resources into. Congressman Crow, I saw you nodding your head a couple of times there, both on the, the drone swarms and then also on ways that the U.S. Is, is potentially working to counter this threat. What are, do you think the U.S. is doing enough to, to work to counter the threat from drones of all sizes? Well, uh, good morning to all of you. Thank you, Courtney, for moderating. I hope you've had enough coffee for a drone discussion at 9 a.m. Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, we, we have, uh, I, I think this recent uh, NDAA uh, makes some very significant investments in drone and counter drone technology, uh, counter UAS. Um, I, I don't think we are ever doing enough, frankly, given some of the investments by uh, China in particular in this area. But we have some really big unanswered questions, too, uh, that, that we have to have some public debate about. And that's just not the technology and the investment, but we have to have a discussion around what is the role of AI going to be? Uh, because we have discussions as a democracy and, and we have uh, we, we take into consideration the moral and ethical implications of drones in ways that some of our adversaries do not. We have to think about the role of AI. We have to think about uh, the whether or not you know humans will remain in the kill chain. Uh, 
uh, because some of our adversaries have decided that, that they, they will not uh, and that the targeting will be done much quicker uh, and without people making those decisions. Uh, and as we look at great power competition and our engagement in Indopaycom and what uh, the scenarios for engagement and some of the war planning look like, um, th that is an essential part of the debate that remains unanswered. And then we have to look at, I think, the what a lot of people have talked about is the tyranny of distance, right? Because a lot of the, the drones that we have right now uh, are not capable of operating over the, the very long distances that we see uh, in PACOM. Uh, and uh, our logistics, our supply chains, our ability to communicate, our ground-based sensors uh, aren't going to be as usable uh, with, uh, with operating and maintaining uh, drones as they are in Europe, for example, where we have to go more towards space-based sensors and operations and communication systems, but also looking at con the contested logistics portion of this, how we maintain drone fleets uh, in a contested logistics environment in uh, Indo-PACOM. General Clark, you, uh, I read an interview you did with Joint Forces Quarterly, and you talked about some left of launch options, specifically where can the U.S. be left of launch to disrupt supply chains, transportation, and development before it's too late. Can you talk about some of the specifics of what the U.S. is doing in this, this area? Yeah, just to... First, again, thanks to uh, the Aspen uh, team for having us here today and the opportunity uh, to be here. Uh, first, it, as we think about this problem, I've been in the Army for 38 years, and in my entire time in the Army uh, on battlefields in Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria, I never had to look up. I never had to look up because the U.S. always maintained air superiority uh, and our forces were protected because we had air cover. But now with everything from quadcopters that are very small up to very large uh, unmanned area vehicles, the th we, we won't always have that luxury. And as we think about this, mo much of our focus to, to your question, Courtney, is about the defeat of the UAS or the UAVs uh, after they've already launched, uh, after they've already taken off, how do we defeat them? But I think there are opportunities for our government, for our intel agencies, uh, and our Department of Defense is how do we stop those drones before they even launch? And what are those supply chains? And what are the intel? And what are the norms of behavior for countries that are going to use these drones? But some. As we see in business, they, they can provide great capability. They could move patients. Uh, they could move uh, supplies around the battlefield that would help. But what are those norms going to be in the future? And I think we have to uh, first look at uh, discussing norms and authorities and how people are going to use them uh, in, in many ways. But I also think from a U.S. government is how are we going to prevent them? And it, when when even discussed in this forum a couple days ago, when it, to show the importance of them, when Russia is running out of them for Ukraine and they're going to Iran to go buy more, should cause us all uh, a bit of concern. Uh, because you can see how valuable that they can be in the future fight. Uh, and, you know, as, as Congressman Crow, the, the cost of entry uh, into this particularly for some of the small uh, unmanned aerial systems, is very, very low. Uh, but I think, you know, for, for opportunities, uh, we, have a, we have a great business and industrial base who can help us with this. Uh, and I think, they, I think this is something that's got to continue to go up uh, in terms of our priority for the protection, not just of our forces that are forward today, that's the, the current problem, but what's going to come home to roost? Uh, and some of these technologies that could, could be used by our adversaries uh, in, you know, on our near abroad or even into our homeland. Can I, can I mention on the, the, the cost of entry and the, de, the defense industrial base component? Because that's such a huge part. You can't have this discussion without talking about procurement and acquisition reform because we have a 20th century contracting system that's designed around large prime systems, right? We put out uh, re, re, requests for proposal. We put out uh, requirements. And then you know, we have a, a five to eight year process by which we go through that. We go through contracting litigation. And by the time we actually feel the system, then it's you know five to 10 years later. And then 
and we actually are locked into these large systems for 20, 30 years. Uh, and, and, and meanwhile, uh, our adversaries are using COTS stuff, commercial off the, the shelf. They're using very inexpensive, very attritable systems, uh, and they recognize that the technological uh, evolution of any system is 18 to 24 months, as opposed to 10 to 15 years, like it used to be, right? So we need radical uh, reform on our contracting systems to actually keep pace with that vastly condensed technological uh, cycle uh, and, and do things that are cheaper, more attritable, uh, and more replaceable. And you're talking about both in the, the drone technology and in the counter drone technology, right? Right. right. And what we have to do is, as well, because uh, I agree, um, interoperability will be very important as well. Um, we have to recognize that we have many allies and partners as we look to the Middle East and with uh, the threat that Iran poses. Not only are we looking at missile defense, but now because of the drone threat, it is, it's air defense in a way that we haven't had to think of before. So we actually do have a bicameral bipartisan act that uh, would allow our Secretary of Defense to work with a number of allies and partners in coming up with interoperability um, systems that are tied together as far as air and, and um, missile defense throughout the Middle East. And again, directed at uh, protecting against the threat that Iran poses. Uh, General Clark, another big emerging threat or challenge is ChemBio. Um, I mean, we've seen just even recently in the last couple of years how something like COVID can have this profound effect on the entire world. It's still having an effect even on us here, right? SOCOM is the coordinating authority for ChemBio. And, and, and there's this vast array of possible weapons. That's the thing that's so fascinating about both the drones and about the ChemBio is you have everything from these very crude agents that we've seen in Syria and Iraq, right? Sarin, mustard gas, to really sophisticated ones that state actors like Russia have used against political opponents. Where do you see the current threat from ChemBio and how, what is the US doing to potentially combat this when just like, again, like the drones, it's such a vast array of, of danger, of challenge. Uh, Courtney, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, as you know, the department has charged SOCOM to look at this threat uh, and to look at the actors that are proliferating this. And uh, you, you raised one uh, in the manner it was used with both chlorine and mustard gases uh, were used in 2014, 15, 16, mainly experimental, but it was used by ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Uh, and through some, act, you know, through some lethal activities, took some of the purveyors that had used those weapon systems off the battlefield. But that just pro should prove to all of us that it's pretty simple to do it. And, and the fact that someone uh, in, in the basement in Mosul uh, with a, a few lab sets can do this. And I think it's something that we, uh, as, as a nation, need to continue to, to push on the norms uh, on this, but then also to continue to look at what those threats are uh, and continue to combat them, uh, because we have both non-state actors, uh, like an ISIS uh, or an Al-Qaeda, who, who continue to look at those uh, as a use, because they instill fear. They instill fear and are basically a terrorist, you know, terrorist weapon system. So we have to, we're, we, we have to ensure that we can protect our own forces uh, that are in the proximity, you know, which we're taking, we're, we're developing uh, new capabilities to do that. But we also have to be aware that they can use them. But then I, I, I think from a state perspective, when, as you just mentioned, Russia is willing to use those against political opponents, they're willing to use them on their own soil, but then to go in on the soil of uh, a NATO ally of the UK uh, and use those, again, low cost barrier uh, into this uh, arena. Uh, and as, as we go into the future, we, we have to be prepared for that eventuality. And I don't think we, you know, we talk about it as much as we should and look for methods to continue to combat it. Yeah, and so to be clear, I think one of the things we're talking about here is that there are now weapons under development and developed that are designed to target specific people. 
Right? That, that's what this is, uh, where you, you can actually take someone's DNA, take you know, their, their medical profile, and you can target a biological weapon that will, that will kill that person or take them off the battlefield or make them inoperable. So you can't have a discussion about this without talking about uh, privacy uh, and, and co uh, commercial data and the protection of commercial data because expectations of privacy have degraded over the last 20 years. Uh, you know, young folks actually have very little expectation of privacy. That's what the polling and the, the data show. Uh, and, and people will very rapidly spit into a cup and send it into 23andMe and get really interesting data about their background. And guess what? Their DNA is now owned by a private company and can be sold off without very, with very little uh, intellectual property protection or, or privacy protection. And we don't have legal and regulatory regimes to deal with that. So uh, we have to have a, an open and public discussion, and this is going to have to be a political discussion, about what does the protection of healthcare information, DNA information, and, and your data look like, because that uh, data is actually going to be procured and collected by our adversaries for the development of these systems. And I'll, I'll add on as well, when we look on, on a broader level, um, who else needs to engage in this? Well, it can be USDA, US Department of Agriculture. So not necessarily those specific human targets with a, a particular type of weaponized biological weapon, but uh, also if we look at food security and what can our adversaries do with biological weapons that are directed at our animal agriculture, at our agricultural sector, hoof and mouth disease, highly pathogenic avian influenza, African swine fever, all of these things have circulated around the globe, but if targeted by an adversary, we know that it brings about food insecurity. Food insecurity drives a lot of other insecurities around the globe. So a few years ago, I had a big fight uh, in the NDAA where we were talking about putting in protections for our food sources here in the United States. But once you paint food security as a national security, it got included. So, uh, you know, there's a number of ways we can look at biological weapons and the need to make sure not only are we securing human beings, um, but then also the food that will sustain us. Yeah, food, it, there was a fascinating panel here yesterday that dealt with that, the food insecurity. And, and we're seeing that really play out right now in Ukraine with this, um, the, with grain, getting the grain out and how it's causing such a ripple effect really around the world. I, and, but I'm, so I'd like to expand on that a little bit, starting with you, Senator Ernst. How do you see a future where food will be increasingly weaponized, potentially? And, and is there anything that the U.S. or even the world can do to mitigate that? Absolutely. It will continue to be weaponized. We see this large in part now. I think folks understand what's going on with Russia and how they are weaponizing uh, food and food supply chains with Ukraine. We have, um, you know, 600 million tons of food in Ukraine, grain stock, that can't move out of the country. So we are going to see food insecurity in the Middle East. We'll see it in Africa. Those are the primary areas that Ukraine exports to. But even as we try to employ our own uses here in the United States through USAID, it's been a real struggle to deliver those food supplies to those in need in Europe and, and other areas. Only about 18% from the two packages that have been authorized by Congress, only 18% of that has actually been delivered forward. It's because we get in our own way. Our bureaucracies are so large. We have so few contractors that are working on, uh, on the movements of this food within USAID. Um, so we have to do better, but absolutely I see in the future where we need to streamline our processes. Uh, cargo preference is also a very big inhibitor of moving food from the United States to other areas. We have some solutions that we've proposed there, but we need action. Um, in a prior discussion this morning, we were talking about admiring the problem, right? And uh, we've heard that, that quote, and thank you so much, Steve. We like to admire the problem, but folks, at what point do we actually get into action? And that's what we've got to do. We've got to streamline the process because it all comes back to food. If we can't sustain our human population, well, for what then? Um, so we've got to do better and deliver where needed and then 
solve those future problems, but we'll continue to see food weaponized, yes. And I don't think you can have a discussion around food insecurity without talking about the impact of the climate crisis, right? Uh, climate change and the climate crisis is both a threat magnifier, so it magnifies all of the existing threats, and it's a threat multiplier, it's creating new threats, right? You, we're seeing vast collapses worldwide in the amount of productive agricultural land, uh, and that, uh, at the same time, you're seeing increases in, in pestilence. Um, uh, you're seeing issues with, um, uh, you know, uh, the changes in the amount of um, productive crops. You're seeing uh, population displacements, refugee flows, all of which are stabilizers uh, politically uh, and from a governance perspective. Perspective. So, um, having a, a broader discussion, and, and I, I have often said that I believe that na uh, that the climate crisis is the the largest national security threat we face, and that's not meant to, to discount uh, the, the you know, kind of traditional threats by state and non-state actors and the technological threats. But if you look across the board as a magnifier and multiplier, uh, that the climate crisis is going to do that. So, getting our arms around how that is changing uh, our threats and, and how it's going to destabilize vast regions of the world. I don't think we really yet understand what we're going to be looking at in the next 10 or 15 years and what we need to be preparing for. I wonder what you think of that, General Clark, because, you know, when you think about it the way that Congressman Crow is laying it out, you have something like a, a, a climate crisis that leads to a migration of a population, then you have a vulnerable population that is that could be exploited by a, net, a terror network or whatever, and that's sort of where you come in. <laughs> the military, but I'm wondering if there's a place where the military comes in ahead of all of that before you have a vulnerable population. In Iraq, uh, 2007, 8, 9, and when we were fighting primarily an Al-Qaeda-based organization, and during that time, you know, some people were laying IEDs, you know, the improvised explosive devices on the road that could kill a U.S. service member. And sometimes, as we, we captured these individuals, they would say, why'd you lay, you know, we'd ask them, why'd you lay that improvised explosive device that could kill you know, one, of our, one of our folks? Well, they, my family needed food. My family needed food, and they would pay me a couple hundred dollars to do that. And, Anyone will do anything to feed their family. And I think as we think about the climate and the impacts to that and the food security, uh, what we're really talking about is recruitment towards ideologies and potential radicalization uh, that we have to be aware of. And if you, you know, that was in a, uh, specifically in a, a unique place, but I think as we look at the impacts today in Ukraine and what could be in places like the Sahel uh, that are already, uh, already uh, low in the food supplies that are going to an underserved population, uh, and what that could do to a rise of a, a radical group like ISIS in that region, uh, where there are already government coups going on in places like Burkina Faso, uh, the Russians are impacting with Wagner Group in Mali. And I think those are the things as we look at what the impact of this could be from a security situation to give uh, radical groups a platform or a location from which to grow. And the minute that they can you know, be in a place and establish uh, governance and law, it gives us a platform like we've seen in the past that could actually come back and attack some of our allies, uh, but that could also attack back in the United States. And I think we have to be uh, cognizant of the impacts of that, of that to our security situation. And part of that, you know, Courtney, I think to get to your baseline question is to be ahead of that, not just from a security st uh, situation standpoint, of, you know, with U.S. military, which we are, uh, you know, U.S. Special Operations Forces does have people in the Sahel, uh, but it's also from providing uh, capabilities, providing food, you know, making sure we have uh, right, the right USAID, uh, the, the right Department of State, uh, and truthfully, civilian uh, government and non-government organizations to assist in this ahead of time. Do you have enough, I mean, you mentioned someplace like Burkina Faso. Do you have an, enough 
special operations forces in some of these countries to actually make a difference, to actually be there, not just to have some access, but actual influence with them? A, a little bit goes a long way. It really does. Uh, and, the, you know, the, when, when, when a small special forces team that is in, in you know, some of the, you know, a place like Burkina Faso can make a huge difference you know, because they see that they see the, the actual manifestation of U.S. presence there and they know it matters. Uh, so, yeah, could there always be more? Yes. Uh, but I, I put less of having uh, a special forces uh, team there as I would having a USAID team uh, or a Department of State team uh, out and about in the hinterlands providing capabilities. I've yet to ever meet a, a general officer, any officer, who says they have enough forces anywhere. But you, got, you always have to ask, right? Um, can, I, can I comment, though, please, on special please. operations forces? And I know, I know General Clark and I have had this, this discussion running uh, ongoing for a couple of years, but quantity is one thing, but then the, what types of forces you have is another. You know, the, the genesis of special operations forces, and I come from the special operations background as well. I, I was a, a, a 75th Ranger Regiment. Ranger before politics. And, um, uh, you know, the, the genesis of Special Operations Forces in America started with JFK and the Green Berets. And, and it was supposed to be a foreign internal defense mission, right? These are our trainers. These are people that engage. They're really warrior diplomats, right? And for generations, that's what the model was. And then we have 20 years of counterterrorism, and it really became more of a direct action strike force, right? We really changed the culture and the training and the orientation of our special operators to be door kickers. So now we have an entire entire generation of these folks that, that uh, have, have been aligned to do that. Now we have to reset. I think what the, the, the allies and partners engagement strategy, what, what, we're, what we need to do going forward in the next decade is go back to that foreign internal defense mission, go back to that warrior diplomat uh, model, still have the door kickers if we need them. But um, uh, it's a cultural change, it's a training change, and it's a, it's a different type of person that we're going to have to uh, fill uh, in these roles to get that job done. Um, like a it's great to have the it's great to have the congressman talk about uh, our command, uh, but <laughs> but uh, but I, I would uh, for for the audience, we're there, uh, and we, we, what a lot of people here may not know with special operations is in about 80 different countries today, uh, with about 5,000 people, and the vast majority are doing exactly what Congressman uh, Crow is describing. Uh, it's small teams, uh, and they're in Africa, they're in Asia, they're in South America, uh, providing that foreign internal defense uh, and making 12 special forces uh, individuals really look like about three or 400 uh, individuals as they're working with others. So future SOCOM MOS will be diplomat door kicker. How about that, <laughs> okay, right? I've, I've just created it right here. Um, another, we, there was another uh, fascinating panel yesterday with General Van Herc, commander of, of NORTHCOM and NORAD, and he said that the U.S. is being attacked every single day in cyber, which isn't surprising to a lot of people here. Um, but that, you know, when you, when you take a step back and think about the U.S. being attacked every single day in cyber, I mean, that's a pretty striking comment. What I'm curious is whether, to all three of you, whether you look at cyber as more of a challenge or a possibly an opportunity. You know, you mentioned the distance for Indopaycom. Like, for instance, if, if the U.S. were to get caught by surprise and, and China were to invade Taiwan, you know, you may have 6,000 miles from where your equipment and, and, and troops are in some cases, but you could respond with cyber pretty quickly. So do you see cyber as more of a threat or challenge or opportunity? Senator Ernst. I would say it's all of the above. So yes, we are attacked regardless of agency across the United States federal government we are hit every single day, thousands of times. Um, we just know that to be true. And, and we also see that at the state and local level with a number of our businesses, you can ask any of the financial institutions about the attacks that happen to them every day. And we have engaged with those business leaders, and it goes back to a point that Jason made earlier um, about privacy issues. You know, it doesn't matter what sector we're looking at, uh, like the banking institutions worry about privacy 
agency. So how much can we engage as a federal government with those private institutions that have very sensitive information? But uh, so we have those, those challenges out there every single day. But because of that challenge, we are the ones that have to turn them into opportunities. So recognize that challenge. Now, what do we do in response to those challenges? But then how can we also participate maybe I can use that word, participate in that space as well to be disruptors of those that are attacking our own systems. So this is the challenge we have uh, as members of Congress in finding that right and delicate balance of how much we can engage as a federal government and at what point does a cyber attack become an act of war? And then how do we respond to that? threshold. Uh, so those are all the, the discussions that we have, but uh, we engage in many different ways. We've seen the, the advent now of Space Force, uh, which of course, if you think about our satellites, much of what we do on the internet, we couldn't do without those uh, satellite technologies in place. So there's a lot of things that we do engage in at the federal government, but I would have to say there are a number of areas that we still are trying to find the right balance to address privacy issues as well as how we are protecting against those cyber, cyber threats. I, I've been primarily concerned uh, with regard to cyber on um, the protection of our intellectual property and our innovation. Right? We, we still have, you know, over 80% of the innovation comes out of the United States, uh, but we are a free and democratic society, so that gives us unique challenges and vulnerabilities with regard to protection of that information. We also approach defense innovation differently, right? Unlike China and others that have uh, greater civil military fusion, uh, we rely substantially on an independent defense industrial base for that innovation. And uh, I'm less I'm less worried for the large prime contractors that have the resources and the capability to secure stuff um, than I am our supply chain. Uh, and there are subcontractors and their vendors and their supply chain because we spend tens of billions of dollars developing these innovative systems, these new technologies that we invest in. And actually by the time, there are many examples, by the time those systems actually get ready to be fielded, our adversaries have already stolen the intellectual property and have developed systems to counter them. So we need unified standards. We need, to, uh, we need to raise the fence around our entire defense industrial base. We need unified standards. We need to do a much better job of looking holistically at what our defense industrial base uh, includes, which by the way, includes less traditional actors than what we would normally consider historically as a defense contractor. Uh, and we need to do much better at protecting it. General, how has cyber changed your job? As, as I look at, I, I agree with both what my esteemed colleagues you know, up here said, but I, I take cyber uh, a bit differently or, or add another aspect to it. And, and that's how our adversaries are using cyber in the information space uh, to get out there, you know, to get out what I would you know, say many cases are false messages uh, in, impact on you know our democratic elections uh, and sowing seeds of misinformation and disinformation uh, as a primary tool. You know we, we've had within special operations we we've had psyops forces to influence. If you go back uh, in the in the 70s and 80s before there was an information, it was over radio, and it was with leaflets and billboards. The internet and the ability to put that rapidly uh, is today is completely different and changes the game uh, in, in, in the things we're talking about. And so I, I look at it primarily from an information base and what the adversary can do. And when, when you think about what is going on in the Ukraine today uh, and the food that's not getting into Africa, the message, if you look at the internet and what is happening from the African countries, it's U.S. sanctions uh, against Russia are causing food shortages in Africa. All right, that's what you'll read in, in many cases on the internet. So we're being blamed uh, for people in Africa not getting eat, to eat, which goes to the previous conversation about food security. But we have to look at how we can combat what is on that internet and get you know, the truth out about what is happening. And I think we have to be able to do that as a government a little bit faster than what we're doing today. So I think that just another aspect as we look at 
the internet and cyber and what it can do? We've seen a, a real change in, in the use of information as a deterrent, even just in the past few months, too. Um, I'm wondering how effective you you see that, what the, the U.S. has been doing, you know, putting out, declassifying all this information about Ukraine. Do you think, is that effective as a deterrent? Oh, I, I, think it's, I think it has been amazing. And I think it should make us you know, look at uh, how we do this in the future. And, and you could, you know, uh, at the beginning, many people didn't believe it uh, because of some of the things that, that we had put out before. Uh, but, and even into one, you know, a week before the invasion, as I was talking to U some Ukrainian uh, counterparts, they still didn't believe it. But I think now we have an opportunity to show that uh, it's the, the intelligence and when we can declassify it. And there's some, some things we want to keep secret. I absolutely acknowledge it. There are things that we need to keep secret to protect uh, our own interests. But there are things I think we need to look harder at when and how and on uh, the rapid basis of which you know, we can call out adversary misbehavior uh, and to show our American public and our allies you know, what uh, some of those behaviors are and what some of those real capabilities uh, are today. We only have a few minutes left, and, and lest we send this audience out feeling completely depressed about all the threats that we've just discussed and how difficult they are to counter, I want to ask each of you, based off what we just talked about, all of these potential challenges, where's the opportunity? Are there places where you see that it's possible that, that the U.S. having to take on these challenges may actually open up the possibility for advancements or technology or, or anything on, on any of the potential threats? Senator? There's, there is always opportunity, and I am so thankful that we do live in the great United States of America, and, and I did hear this uh, when I attended the NATO summit a few weeks ago, just how encouraged other countries are and, and how much they really value U.S. partnership. And I, I always get very concerned about that as I look around the globe, but I heard over and over again, uh, we are with you. If America is willing to lead, we are with you, and we need you. So I think that that is where I see the greater opportunity. And I shared with a group earlier this morning that relationships really matter. And I think our human capital is extremely important here in the United States. And it's important to have presence to be places, to engage with other leaders, to exhibit leadership that others can look to, not just in times of crisis, but uh, in between those times of crisis, and that they know that we can be that partner of choice, that they don't have to turn to China. So I think that is the great opportunity ahead of us, is that we can really share ideas and values around the world and be that good partner for others to lean on in those times of crisis, and a collaborator in in times that aren't so dire. Yeah, I mean, being a free, open, and democratic society certainly has its challenges, right? And um, uh, you, know, you look at um, you look at our adversaries, and, and you know they can they can look long term, they can do things with the command and control economy that we can't do. But I still believe firmly, and I don't believe I'm naive in thinking this that uh, the the advantages of a free and open and democratic society far outweigh that. Now, one, you know, just setting aside the the moral and ethical arguments, but uh, we have tough discussions. Uh, we are still the preferred partner around the world. Uh, people want to uh, engage with us uh, because their people want to engage with us. And we, had, we did have a discussion, uh, you know, the three of us had a discussion earlier about the challenges of that and you know, the, the aspiration of the American idea and some of the challenges we face worldwide. And I don't mean to undersell or discount those challenges because they're real, but I still firmly believe that uh, if, if we can ap approach this um, with some some intention that we can do better and we can win the day. But I'm more concerned as an elected official uh, in America in the year 2022 that when I leave here, we'll go back to my district today about making the domestic case for international engagement. Because we do have a real challenge in doing that. Uh, the bottom line is there is isolationism and nationalism that's sweeping the world 
not just the United States, it's a worldwide phenomenon. And uh, gone are the days where we just take for granted the ability that you know, policymakers in DC can go and say we're gonna do X, Y, and Z, and people just allow it to happen. We have to make the case, and, and frankly, at the end of the Cold War, we had the peace dividend in the 1990s, and then 9-11 happened, then we were distracted for 20 years fighting the global war on terror. So for the last three decades, we really haven't been making the case uh, in, in the way that we need to for democratic engagement, global engagement, why American leadership matters. And we have to figure out what that looks like. We have to make it domestically first. Yeah. Wow. Hard, hard, hard to follow up on that one, but uh, I'll, I'll go back to the African proverb. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go together. And you know, our, our people and pulling people together uh, are uh, our decisive advantage. And using what Senator Ernst was just talking about, when the Ukraine crisis occurred, our special operators you know, that are in Germany pulled to get, you know, said, hey, who wants to come join this coalition? This is not NATO. You know, we don't have a NATO construct against Ukraine, you know, specifically for Ukraine. And within, within 24 hours, 17 countries came you know, to our teams and said, we want, we want to help. Uh, and those were relationships that were built in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, over decades of door kicking you know, with diplomats uh, to be able to uh, build uh, real credible capabilities, to share intel with the Ukrainians, to provide the Ukrainians training, even though we didn't have forces in. And that's, that's the power of the United States and the opportunity to be able to convene. Uh, even the, without formal construct. Uh, we only have a moment left, but uh, General Clark, I'm gonna take a moment of uh, personal privilege here and say that after about 40 years in uniform, you're what, about T minus 40 days to retirement, I believe? I went into journalism, so I didn't have to do math, but I think it's about 40 days. <laughs> so what I'm wondering is, I know that special operators love to talk about themselves, especially in front of a big group of people. <laughs> that's, so, that's the SEALs. They're, they're yeah. Quite, yeah. Yes, that's the he's SEALs. Not, he's not yeah. a SEAL. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a, do you have a, is there a memory, is there a story, was there something that you were a part of, and I can imagine many, many interesting things you did in your, your time in, in the military that you can share here? I, I put on the uniform of, of my country uh, 42 years and three weeks ago uh, when I entered the military. Oh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting applause uh, when, when, I, when I raised my hand on the plains of West Point. And truthfully, I had no intention uh, beyond West Point, uh, beyond my five-year commitment to serve. Uh, but I fell in love with soldiers. Uh, and then since then I have fallen in love with, with our service members in a joint force at, at SOCOM. Because our, our men and women, those are a decisive advantage. Uh, they're committed, they're courageous, they're brave. Uh, and they do this with little fanfare. And they're willing, as they sign up for their oath, you know, to raise that right hand, to give their lives for everyone in this, in this room. And, and that's what kept me in. And I, I could give numerous stories uh, of visiting hospital beds, of presiding over you know, funerals, uh, comforting uh, a widow in her time of need, or a mom or a dad. Uh, but I always walked away from those, comforted that they lifted me up. They said that their sons and daughters were doing what they wanted to do to serve this great country. And, and I would hope that all of us, uh, whether you're in business or whether you're in government, you know, think about that each and every day, uh, that we have these great, brave Americans that are willing uh, to lay down their lives for all of us. We should make sure we commit to them, but we should also be able to pull together uh, for those domestic things that, that Congressman Crow was talking about. And, and both of our members up here served in uniform, and they understand that. Uh, but it, it's been the honor of my lifetime uh, to be able to wear this uniform, and, and I, I appreciate, Courtney, that final question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. I appreciate all your time. Thank you.